ripped apart by horses, torn apart by horses, surrounded by evil forces, hundreds at the left, thousands at the right, how can Prophesy before your eyes It will come to pass It's said in Deuteronomy Obey all his commands Lest ye forget Lest ye forget The date is August 21st, 1831, on a silent summer evening. Inspired by signs from God, Nat Turner leads a revolutionary slave rebellion that sent shockwaves to Southampton County, Virginia. Going from plantation to plantation, murdering the white slave owners and setting free the slaves, recruiting them to his army with each conquest on a holy mission of freedom. Was he the enraged murderer that the media portrayed him to be? Was he merely inspired by the dream of freedom? Like so many slaves often were. Was he driven by divine purpose? What revelations did Nat see in the Holy Bible? Who was Nat Turner? Join us as we answer these questions and many more. Nat Turner, the slave, the prophet, the hero. Um, Nat Turner was making reference to the book of Revelations chapter 20, all right? Um, he had some pretty, you know, basic understanding of the scriptures. He knew who the serpent was, being a so-called white man. Just like our native brothers, they say the white man speaks with a forked tongue. What has a forked tongue? A snake, a serpent. Uh, however, Nat Turner was in the wrong time period. Revelation chapter 20 is talking about after the thousand year reign with Christ, but that's going somewhere else. Um, as far as the first should be last and the last should be first, that's making reference to the book of Genesis when Jacob came out, Esau came out and Jacob took hold of, of Esau's heel and also 2 Ezra 6 and 9 when it, where it says Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning, the beginning of it that followed. Okay, Nick got the title general from his, 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 his soldiers or from his, his, um, the people who joined with him. He didn't call himself a general. Unlike a lot of people that, you know, you look back in history that when, as soon as they get a, something started, they give themselves the title general. He accepted himself as the leader, but he never ever took the title of his own. He said that he was called general by his, when he rode up, to the, after he collected a group of slaves and they like I say, he had sent them out in three different directions and then they all met back together again. Now that again shows his leadership ability because he sent this group of slaves out on their own and told them a place to where they were to rendezvous, which is the term we use today, and they did so. The directions when he broke them off was at night and they had to navigate their way through the way he told them to go and find out to get to that location is the assumption would be made that the slaves knew where they were going, obviously, as Nat did. But even with that, they still could have went in any direction, could have went someplace else. But he was able to collect all of his groups back together. And when those groups had collected back with the slaves that they had bought with them as they picked up along the way, who themselves didn't know Nat's plan. They didn't even know that the insurrection had started until it came to their house. And then those slaves were able to convince them to go, and they came because of Nat. And when Nat came up and joined with them, that's when they all cheered out and referred to him as General Nat. Then when he went to another location, which he had sent the force ahead of him, and by the time he caught up with them, they had already killed all the white people who were there at the house. They all hailed him as General Nat again. The, the term general was referred to by some of the slaves in their trial when they were captured later on. And that's where the term General Nat came from. But 
Ned himself, even in his, after in his trial, he never referred to himself as a general. He was the leader. He accepted the responsibility of the leader, but he didn't give himself a title. The lady who lived there. This is where Ned was believed to have gotten soy that he had when he was captured. So Ned. Wow. It would took as much as 10 days before the bodies were found. Wow. Yeah. So they already decomposed and everything. We're talking August. They were smelling pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, at the, um, at the Whitehead place, they even talked about some of the folks, when they white people, when they came there to it, that they had discovered that the pigs had been eating on the bodies. Because mm. pigs are scavengers. Mm -hmm. And meat is, you know, they eat anything that's meat. Yeah, tell you all what you eat. Nat Turner understood the role that he had to play. He understood what he was ordained for, what he was destined for. And like I said before, his um, role model was Jesus the Christ. And he understood how Christ died for his people. He knew that he had to die for his people. And he knew that it wouldn't be uh, um, a wonderful death. It wouldn't be a pleasant death. He would either be hung or crucified just like Christ was crucified. And Nat Turner was ready for that. He understood that. Because remember, he ran away from one of his plantation owners. But by him not being selfish, he returned back for his people. And he understood what would be the results of that insurrection. His main objective was to go throughout plantation and plantation, uh, pick up as much um, resources as he could, resources being free, uh, the slaves and ammunition and so forth swords guns and knives however he did say that he would not he was not going to kill those poor whites that lived amongst the slave owners who they themselves didn't own slaves that's why he spared them but the women and men and children who had slaves they were put to death I could say a little bit, but not really much. I don't think Nat had a lot of information about Gabriel Prasa. Um, it was just for the, for the basic sense of time. Uh, 1800 to 1822, when Nat began to start really giving serious considerations to an insurrection. And by 1828, when he put the insurrection, started putting it into his plan. I don't think he carried too much information about Gabriel Prasa. I believe he was given more directions towards what he was receiving from the Bible. Now, there was other things that had happened during that same time period. Uh, in 1824, the American Colonization Society started to send slaves or freed slaves back to Liberia. They had established the colony of Liberia, and a lot of slaves from Virginia were sent to um, Liberia, including some out of Southampton County. There's documented evidence. Uh, one of the presidents of Liberia, a fellow by the name of uh, Garner, was his family was free from out of Southampton County. And he was born in Liberia, but he became the president of Liberia in 18, 1888. Um, so Nett could have heard about that. He obviously would have been known about, um, words would have popped up and been passed around through word of mouth from the slaves that if you could get free, you could go back to Africa. But, I don't, but because Nett's direction was geared to freedom here, I don't think he would have followed through with that as an area. Um, some of the other insurrections and in other areas about, you know, other slave revolts that occurred in other areas of the country, including in the Caribbean. Uh, he might have heard some about that too. But apparently from everything that I've read on that, all of his directions and all of his inspirations for his insurrection came from within himself, from what he said he received from God and from his interpretations from what he read in the Bible. So that's the way it originally looked. Had a porch out on it, with the big windows up at the front. There's that window there. And there was a doorway up there too. But this was a real stately house. So this is the Porter House. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the Reese House. Right.
Now he could have, this is where he could have got the Bible from. You know, some uh, altruistic or you know, white person could have decided that the Negroes needed the Bible or the Negro preacher needed the Bible and gave it to him. So supposedly the white people would listen to him preach because he was so much more better at it than the white preachers. A militant mindset instills discipline, order, and structure in the men, okay? Nat Turner understood that. That's why they called him general. And his men were in rank order. They had different ranks. Um, when you read the confessions of Nat Turner, he said how they were always marched. They were marched to, from one plantation to the next. They even were riding on horses, all right, which was forbidden during that time as you see in the movie Django and so forth, all right? Because slaves were not supposed to ride on horses. The people that rode on horses were people of high stature, people of position. Nat Turner took this as a sign from God that it was time for him to go forth with his plans of the insurrection. Unfortunately, on the night of the, of the eclipse, it did not happen, okay? Um, however, What's inspirational and what's divine is that the slave insurrection of Nat Turner occurred on August 21st, 1831. What other insurrection or slave revolt happened during that time? The Haitian slave revolt, okay? And Nat Turner wasn't even born yet when the Haitian slave revolt started, which was in August 21st, 1791. That's when the Haitians started revolting against tyranny, against oppression from the French Caucasians, and they gained their freedom, I believe, in 1804. Okay, but it started August 21st, the same day that Nat Turner had his in 1831. All right, so I believe that was a divine inspiration of, of God, that those two slave revolts were on the same exact day. Referring to his, com his confessions, Nat said that after his last battle, when he realized that all hope was lost, he and two other slaves worked their way back into the swamps near Cabin Point. And he sent those two slaves out, named, one was named Davy and I think the other was Temple, to pass the word around that he would be there at Cabin Point waiting for any slaves who would join him, just so he could raise another army. After three days of waiting there and they didn't return, he assumed that they had been captured. There's no record that they were captured. They probably would just went back home. Uh, he said that after a few days of waiting there, somebody he started seeing white people coming around as though they were looking for someone. So he decided that now that everything was lost, so he decided to go into hiding. And he went into an area of the woods near where he had originally started from, near the cabin pond, and he hid out there in what they call a cave. People think of the term of a cave as being this piece of monolithic thing similar to a cave that you would see in Luray Cave. It was really just a hole that he dug in an embankment under a tree. Mm. And he lived in there for over 60 days, coming out only at night to get food and water and probably to go around the houses. It was also during that time that he more than likely had communications with his wife and probably a few other slaves. But he said that one night when he had been out and he came back, a dog had came into the cave for some food that he had hidden there. And then a few nights later, that same dog came back with some other slaves who were hunting, and they discovered him, and he'd been afraid that those slaves would turn him in. He left that cave and went to another location. He hid out from the, when the army, the, again, the militia started looking for him because the word was now had been passed out. Net, a lot of them had thought Ned had escaped to the Dismal Swamp. Mm -hmm. During this whole time of those nearly 70 days that he was out in hiding, no one knew exactly where he was. Well, no white people knew that he was. They were still looking for him. There was wanted posters out. There were militias on the road every night looking for him. But he managed to avoid them and stay hidden. And on his last day when he was captured, he said he was hiding again from a group of militia when Benjamin Phelps just happened to come across where he was hiding and raised his gun on him. And he said that he felt that it was better to turn himself in to Benjamin Phelps than to one of the militia groups. Which was probably a smart move because the militias group probably would either shot him or hanged him right then and there. Benjamin Phelps took him in to get the reward. And that's how he was brought in for trial. So um, 
that's the, you know, again, those were the actual facts about it. The legends of it was how many places he traveled to, that he went into um, people's houses and you know, did chop up some more people later on. None of that was true. Who wants to be associated with that? When I was in Africa, you know, a lot of the African people told me that you shouldn't say you're from slaves. You're an American. Because they're and slaves. This is, and this slaves is what the people. Africans were telling you when yeah. you went to Africa? Yeah. They look, a lot of Africans look down on America, black, American blacks as being beneath them because they're descended from slaves. Hmm, I wonder why. But and then one of, uh, another one of uh, the girls, uh, Romaine, is because she was a Turner. She was one of the black ones. She married a Turner. And then another, one of the guys, Leslie Turner, who's buried over on that side over there, he was one of the black ones too. He married a young lady whose last name was Turner. So they intermarried. <laughs> Well, it was, you know, you're in the county out here. I mean, you know, you couldn't go but so far. Right. And so you had to take what was available. And they were good looking women. Turners were some fine looking folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they took what was available. We used to have it was is that as long as you were not directly first cousin or sister, you, everything else was okay. Yeah. And what also during that time period too, uh, which was quite common among the, particularly in the 1930s and 1940s, Black families used to do mixing up where they would pick out who you were supposed to marry. Right. Arrange marriages. Like right. That. Because they wanted to maintain a certain quality or a certain trait within the family. The Eternals on the white, on the light side, on the, the, the white side, they were very light. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to try to match up light to light, dark to dark or whatever. And so the end results of that, that's why you had some of them that were sometimes cousins married over to each other. Mm -hmm. And like I said, now my mother and father, even though they, my mother and her family's name, my mother's dark. So I ended up, you know, being in a nice blend in the middle. Mm. But my father looked almost white. <laughs> when he was in the military during World War II, they kept trying to throw him in the white side because the military was segregated during World War II. Mm. Wow. And he had to stand up to say, no, he was not, that he was not white. But, you know, from looking at him, there was no way you could tell that he wasn't white mm. because his mother is white, mm -hmm. my grandmother. Mm. At least he didn't deny his black side. Right. You see, Herbert Turner was half white, but Anzella, who was his wife, was his third wife, she was mostly all white, but she was a little bit of Indian, but she looks almost all white. So her children that she had with him were all white, but the children that he had with his other wives were dark. Mm -hmm. right. People used to like, say the average picker was expected to pick over 200 pounds a day. Otherwise, you get a whip. A good, a exceptional whip, um, exceptional picker man could pick 300 pounds a day. So net would usually be expected to pick anywhere between 250 to 300 pounds wow. of cotton a day during cotton season. And oh. It only comes in once a year. Oh. Wow. But during the time when it's in, they had to collect it and get it in. Now during that time, corn was more of the bigger crop than cotton. They did grow cotton out here. And peanuts didn't come until later. All right. Tobacco was a big crop and corn was the big crop. So the house is like back there with the The house is right over there. Where the opening is, on this side right over here. All right. When they came out. That was where, well, that was where the house was moved to. That was where it's either the slaves that lived at and the main house was further down there. So they actually killed them in down there. But this was the house that was, it stood here for a long time, but the house wow. that they were actually killed in. The Turners no longer own any of this land over here, nor do the Francis. So this cotton that I just picked, from the, the, the yeah. plantation. Yeah. The use of it. Yeah, see what you do is the, the cotton gin, you see the seeds in it? Yeah. The getting the seeds out was the hardest part. That's why you have to have a cotton gin. Oh, and right. trying to pull that seed out during the time of Nat Turner, the cotton gin had just started being developed. And the way you get the, the you have to pull that seed out of that the seed out of there. So that's what they it was getting the cotton or the seed. That's what they what they wanted. They wanted the, the, the fiber. Mm. You get the seeds out. And then now you could take this, if you take this and start rolling it, let's just throw these seeds down, and, and roll the cotton like that. You can make it into a thread. All right. This is my, well, I'll show this is amazing. Okay. Yeah. See, roll it into a thread. And you keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it and rolling it till it becomes strong enough as a, as a material. And then they, they mix it with some, um, with some type of liquid that makes it stick together, and then you, you to twist it and twist it and twist it, tighten, tighten it, tighten it, and you can get a fiber, see? All right, yeah. 
and you do enough of that, then you can get a thread with it, and the threads you can weave it together, and that's where you make your cloth. So this is the basis for the textile industry as it developed, was cotton. And so you just keep twisting it, keep twisting it, you can make a, a thread. So he had to pick 300 pounds, and he had to pull his seed out? Well, the, before that, yeah, they had other slaves who would use it. Whatever. Right. The people would kick it out of the field, bring it in. And when it had to be done by hand, as you can see, it was very difficult to get all that seed out. Well, the cotton gin was the first machine that was built by Eli Whitney to mechanically remove the seed. That made growing cotton as a cash crop very profitable. Wow. Because back then, for instance, to try to gin this much field, you usually would get 2,800 pounds anywhere from 2,800 pounds to 3,000 pounds of cotton per acre. This is about a 40 acre field right here. Wow. So you're talking 40 times 2,800. So you're dealing with what about around about 82,000 pounds of cotton. I'm thinking to myself, you just going through it, you got to pick it like that. It. Yeah, you just. And yeah, they used yeah. to pick it in three or four different phases. As you see, some of it is already out. Yes. So in the old days, they would come through and pick it as soon as it started to go out. Then as the other bowls would open up, they would come back and pick it again. They all wouldn't right. wait for it all to come out. Now that they use machines, they have to wait for it all to open up. All right. But when it's like that, you run the risk that the, the weather can go bad on you. Or because it's dry, it can catch on fire and you can lose the whole crop. Right. Mm. So slaves used to have to come out here and work in this day sun up to sundown every day to pick this stuff. I'm keeping this yeah. memorabilia. This is uh, official cotton from the Travis Plantation. All right, that Nat Turner slaughtered right here. Oh, my praises. Keep What's it. the basis for the reason for why Nat Turner was a slave? Confidence was to be gained. The thought of freedom was to be gained. The, to inspire the minds of other so-called slaves was to be gained. All right. Um, the slaves at that we had to um, the slaves at that time we had to serve out our captivity because it was written in the Holy Bible. All right. Inspiration is a big thing with our people. If we could inspire the minds of one, we could inspire the minds of a thousand. So Nat Turner understood this, even though he was unable to free all of the so-called blacks that were in captivity at that time. He was able to inspire the people, give the people some kind of sense of hope. Nat Turner teaches us a lot today. He teaches us that um, whatever state we're in, whatever um, position we're in, we can never rise above our people. One thing that sticks out in my mind about Nat Turner is that he ran away from his plantation. He ran away from his slave master. He left everything, left his wife, ran away. The reason he came back because he understood the will of his father. He came back for the rest of the slaves. He came back to freedom because that was the will of his father, all right? As pertaining to his visions that he had, his, um, his dreams that he had, and from him just researching the scriptures, he knew that he was ordained for some great pur purpose. You know, a lot of our people just, you know, in society today, a lot of our people, they're, they're uh, a selfish people. They're out for self. But Nat Turner was about his people. He was ready to put his life on the line because he knew he was going to die. Most of the times when he engaged in conversations with the other slaves, he was discussing death. He knew he was going to die, but he was ready to die for his people. Most blacks and Hispanics today were not ready for that. Our forefathers was on another level. So Lord willing, we're able to reach to be on the level of um, our forefathers. Uh, one of the things I always do, I consider is my life's work and my, and my contribution to the Nat Turner legend is to pass on the information that I've accumulated over the years to Nat so that the actual fact can be given. As I said, the actual fact of Nat Turner's life was from October 1st, October 2nd, 1800 to November 11, 1831. The fiction or the history and the myth of the man since that time has been many variations and many, many different ways of people have interpreted or presented that information. Some of it accurate, some of it not very accurate, some of it just plain long out and out false, and some of it even maliciously out and out false. 
So if I can, through what I've accumulated and pass on and through functions such as this, can educate just a few people with who the real Nat Turner was, then I feel that my goal and my commitment to, to Nat and my commitment to my lineage to Nat is fulfilled. So hopefully um, you guys can use this information or you, or you use this information any way you want to and we'll use it to educate others, pass this information along. Nat Turner was a real person. He was not a myth. He was not a gigantic figure in history that was made up. He really lived. He really died. He had a family. He had goals. He had objectives. He had wishes just like everybody else did. The only thing that made his life so different was he was a slave. And in doing so, he tried to change that condition that he was born into. And he didn't die as a slave. He actually died as a free man because he had killed his owners. Right. And so he was not, even though the, the state of Virginia did pay $375 to the descendants of Putnam Moore, who was his last owner, they did not own title to Nat Turner. So on the day that he was hanged, November 11, 1831, Nat Turner died a free man, not a slave. Um, there was a poem that I wrote years ago, and I sometimes give lecture to people and Nat was, as far as we know, was, like I say, was not given a decent burial or the, the benefit of a burial, nor did the people in the area be allowed to stand around his grave and grieve him or anything else. He was, again, the whites tried their best to eradicate him from history, to just say that he was a non-existent, non-person. And um, I thought that if Nat had been given his opportunity for someone to speak for him, that these were the words that he would probably would have wanted to be said. And so the poem I wrote back in 1999, and if you guys would give me the opportunity, I would like to read that to you yeah. so that it could be passed along as well. Um, they're passing it over here. There it is. Okay. The title of the poem is Speak For Me. I would do it from memory, but my memory is, I'm getting old now. My memory is not as good. All right. <laughs> so in case that I haven't been it for a while, but again, it says Speak For Me, and this is for Nat Turner, that if he had had a funeral, that if I had been there, I would have read this standing beside his grave. It says, much can be said about me now that the veil of night has drawn its final curtain. How I am remembered by those yet to draw upon this life is not mine to say for certain. On my legacy, I wish for no long or protracted words be said of my recorded fight. Instead, my children, speak for me to those who follow of the wrongs I tried to make right. To the special men and women who heard my call and answered with bravery and charity of heart, speak for me to them and say, he is home, with heaven earned as his lasting reward. On my God, my Jesus, in whom I found the sweetest joys and loving bliss, speak for me to those still bound in darkness that I strive for them to know him thus. My star has blinked. Eclipsed from these mortal skies by newer diamonds of the hour. Please speak for me to each of them and say, Freedom will reign in all of their tomorrows. This, I believe, would have been the words that Nat would have wanted the public to know about him because I believe it states who he was, what he was trying to do, and that he wants to be remembered in history as a man who sought freedom. The incident of the insurrection was just a step. To that and it was a step that needed to be done but it's the step that we remember but the other things the freedoms the people who carried on the new diamonds the hour those are the people who follow I'm one of those diamonds my grandchildren are one of those diamonds and I hope your children and your grandchildren will be those diamonds who will receive net freedoms